Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Divine Feminine Healers podcast. I'm so excited to have Dr. Suri Chang Khalsa on the podcast today, sharing all of her wisdom. And yeah, we're just going to jump right into it. So I am so curious, how do you connect to the Divine Feminine Energy? You know, this is something I love because I think for each person, there's a slightly different definition of that and a slightly different pathway for that. So for me, and especially from my studies of Ayurveda, the divine feminine is a capacity of both holding and movement. It has duality, non-duality in it. By that, I mean, I think about the womb, the space within that holds the container for things to be created, but also the co-creative energy that creates said things. And I see that in myself when I'm creating, and that could be creating my what I'm cooking, it could be a conversation, it could be a piece of art, it could be how I'm approaching my just day to day life, which is this general principle of, let me hold this container of self compassion and awareness, and then generate energy within that for actions to happen. I think it's a very um, mistaken idea to believe that the divine feminine is only sitting in repose in quietude, emanating love. I think it's a very primitive, primal, massive force of nature that women or people connecting to the divine feminine can bring and relate to. And I think that that kind of connection to power is um, can be overwhelming for, for, for men around you, for men in your life, for the men of the world, and particularly as we're speaking in a time of un, sort of paralleled um, back sliding in human rights. So um, that's kind of how I see it. It's everything that you said just feels so relatable in the moment. And even more so in this came up in my community recently, I, what was my post on it, but we were talking, I was talking about the divine feminine and how she likes to lead. And someone in the community said, the divine feminine doesn't lead, the masculine leads. And I said, I understand where you're coming from. I understand this viewpoint and where you're getting it at. But the ancients taught us that we have Mother Kali, that we have Mother Durga, of strength and power, of ferocity that sometimes we need. And that is love still. That is still um, the divine feminine in her fullest form. And I think this relationship with power, it just seems like this is a theme that's coming up so much this year. On an individual level, I've been experiencing it, but now I'm just, it's all over the collective that what is our relationship to power? And each divine feminine woman really expresses that in such a unique way. And I do think we're leaders. I think that the way that we lead is just in a different way, that it, it doesn't show up maybe in the way that masculine energy can, can lead in their own way. I am kind of curious, just to kind of dive a little more deeper into this relationship to power. How do you emanate your power as divine feminine? Well, it's interesting. So. Um... As you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a physician and I've grown up, I'm 50. So I've grown up in a time where women were really just starting to emerge in medicine. For many, you know, many hundreds of years, the model is male doctor, female nurse, right? The doctor's in charge and the nurse is the assistant. We also understood that a lot of the nurturing and tenderness that took place in healing was being um, transmitted through the nurses, through the through that continuum and that the this sort of decision making body was held by male you know da, 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 this is what i assess this is what i see and really in the modern medical western if you will model we had sort of extracted ourselves from intuition developing and honoring intuition and healing developing and honoring whole person healing systems that had come before us it becomes the, as I like to say, the altar of evidence, you know, like let's all sacrifice ourselves on the altar of evidence. And for me, power was um, knowing how to use my energy correctly to still hold that frequency of awareness that these things, these lineages, this passageway is still accurate, valid, and true. But on this other track, I couldn't just burn myself out flaming out over the course of my career, fighting every battle. So power to me, which I didn't do well always by all, by all measures, but hey, you know, we're not interested in perfection here. 
power for me was holding enough awareness and enough self-compassion of like, I'm alive in this time, I'm choosing to be in this body and in this impossible role, impossible at times, and yet still holding compassion for myself, joy, creativity, continued study, continued diving into these other traditions of healing and honoring and maintaining all my credentials and all of my standing and all of the pieces I needed to within that classic male-oriented model, which is the classic divine feminine to me. Yes, and. Not either or. Yes, and. Yes, I am that. And and I am this. And that to me was a very... Um, it took a lot of energy and there was a certain point where I was like, this system is too toxic. I'm going to step out of it. But for 20 plus years, I sat inside it and said, I, I represent this. And many of my colleagues came to understand that that power that I held was actually a transforming energy in my clinical relationships. And that patients who had, who were hopeless, even from like big, big tertiary, I trained at Mayo Clinic, but really big tertiary referral centers would send patients to me, this little lowly primary care physician, not in any kind of academic appointment. And we would journey them back towards health as opposed to just living in this sick model. And I think that um, I, I gained a lot of respect for my capacity as a clinician through the years from my colleagues, because I wasn't saying you should do it this way. I just modeled it. I said, this is how we do it. This is how it's done when there are no other solutions. I wish it wasn't so extreme that it had to come to end points of like, nobody else can help this person. They're exhausting the system. You know, let's send them to Dr. Siri John. No, I would have liked the intersection to have been far earlier and said, hey, listen, what if we look at these facets of where healing can reside? before the person has progressed through years and years of um, dead end medical therapy. And I think that probably a lot of people drawn to Ayurveda and whole person healing systems have had some intersection with the medical system that has been beyond vastly unfulfilling and really in the colonialized uh, patriarchal model. And, and that's, you know, that's straight up facts having lived in it. And, you know, people argue with me online and I'm like, <laughs> you have like a literal no idea what you're talking about you've not you don't even know medical terminology like you don't even know medical terminology how could you possibly know 40 plus years of study how could you know what I know how how it's just absurd it's laughable it's, it's so it's yeah at any rate you have to laugh you have to, and that that's where I, I notice. And when I don't laugh and I'm like deeply triggered, I, I go in and I do my work, but it is laughable when you, when, when you look at it that from that perspective. But I, I love the point that you brought up about, it basically comes down to intuition because it's not, the masculine is, you know, has that structure and maybe more rigidity, at least from what our projection of it is. And it's really about what do I need in this moment? That's a divine feminine intuition. And that it's not right or left, it's not black or white. And I think that's so hard for our world to grasp. But if we had that flexibility, that adaptability that the divine feminine has in holding her power, we would have a lot more answers like you were discussing with having certain patients and then giving them this diagnosis that feels um, very restricting to them to say the least. Yeah, and I think even the older medical model, there was a very well-known philosopher called Sir William Osler. He, even his principles, which were many of the founding, if you will, principles in medicine, he always said, it, you know, it's not the, the disease the patient has, it's the patient who has XYZ happening. And I think, you know, we, we become so myopic in thinking, well, this is an assignment now, I have this label and I myself as a being in the complexities, my trauma, my sleep, my food, my movement, my community, my sense of purpose, all that has been stripped from being relevant to this diagnosis because surgery or medications are the solution and they're not. It's just not like come for me. Like, you know, 
I mean, you know, I guess I'm just a little bit at this juxtaposition where I'm like, kind of try, I've tried to be really soft. I've tried to be really gentle in the way I say these things, but I think I'm at this intersection now where it's like, nah, nah, I'm not going to do that anymore. Like, this is common sense. We've, we've, common sense is gone. So definitely, definitely. I, and that, and that, and that's love too, you know, giving that ferocity and that at hard edge, sometimes we have to learn the lessons in those ways. And I am just so fascinated by your background and story of being in the medical world for so long, and especially as someone who's so intuitive, just those inklings and maybe having to suppress them and, and push them aside because of what the rest of the world is living by is so difficult. So I'm so curious, how did you come or you know, get that courage to really leave your position in the medical world and start to seek Ayurveda and Reiki? Well, you know, what happened is like my own healing and, you know, a little backstory here. So I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., which feels this story feels so relevant to me. I don't talk about this very often, but I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. and connected to a very loving and sort of liberal family. But the environment around me embodied this sort of um, patriarchal, capitalistic, upwardly mobile, intellectual kind of paradigm. I didn't grow up with any connection to metaphysical thinking whatsoever. I grew up in a pretty conservative Presbyterian church. And um, there was, I believe the soul has its own flower or time to flower. So, you know, there was a certain aspect of the poison I had to eat until the awakening arrived. And, and, and once that started to happen and, and my undergraduate was at UVA, which is you know good old boys sort of network in a lot of political oriented families and people end up in that, in the structure of UVA. So I think the two together really provided me with um, more than a spoonful of medicine of the, of the patriarchy. And when you are who, whoever it is one is, I do believe there are come certain passage points, like critical passage points, where you realize like, wow, this is, I'm really off. My body's not functioning well. I'm having all these other issues. I don't think this is my natural state, but it's my thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and actions that are driving these imbalances. And I just didn't understand I just didn't understand it because I'd never been given any other perspective or any way, any other way to think about things. And so I had a kind of classic child, childhood upbringing, loving family, very advantage. So my intellect could develop, I could be tested into, you know, gifted and talented programs. But there was this whole other narrative that I was absorbing and sinking in, of course, I was there with Jimmy Carter and Reagan and Bush, you know, in those eras where um, political deals were as common as they are now, where back backstory narratives are happening. And you see that, you see that at the cocktail party, you see that at the high school graduation, you see that at the country club, you see that at the sorority and fraternity galas, like it just happens all the way through that. And I had bought into so much of that as that's who I am. And it caused a lot of physiologic imbalance and mental, emotional, spiritual imbalance. And I think as I unlearned it, as I unraveled it, I had to keep seeking out new modalities to, to lessen its hold on me. And um, that it's that simple. I mean, even when I was in the pre-med time, I was looking at naturopathic schools. I was looking at acupuncture. I was looking at Ayurveda, so the 1994 through 96, kind of in that time frame. So I was always pretty progressive. However, um, uh, you know, just not my own personal path to step fully outside. And, and I see now, because one of the primary things I do now is provide mentoring, support, and education around these topics to physicians which I never would have been able to have done as an outsider. So there were definitely many dark moments. And so if, if anyone's listening who feels like, I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm here. My intuition tells me so strongly I am to be here. I feel lonely. I feel isolated. You know, this is where 
I think we're at in terms of creating community and connection and collaboration that wasn't there for me. We're at an unprecedented time where women can do those three things, connect, collaborate, create community to support the people that feel siloed and isolated who are holding down a particular perspective in whatever field, law, medicine, education, um, and even in law enforcement, you're going to find people who have this kind of inner awakening and they're like, wait, I can't leave this job for X, Y, Z reasons, but it's so diametrically opposed to my internal moral spiritual compass. So I don't know if that's kind of a roundabout way of talking about it, but I think that really the way I ended up learning all these things is that I needed the healing. I needed the healing. And um, I think the most radical thing anyone can do right now, the most revolutionary thing anyone could do right now is to engage in their own self-healing. Definitely. And it's why the tons of healers that I've interviewed, it always comes back to first, they had to build that trust back with their body and it always shows up in their bodies because that's the experience. That's the knowledge. That's where all the wisdom comes from that they could start to share with everyone else. And I'm so fascinated by medical doctors that transition to this world because you're in this environment that's just like completely different and you're in there and like you said, it happens in all these other structures that we have in our lives. But I'm curious, as you started to have some of these insights, did you ever share that with um, colleagues or other doctors? Like, hey, like I've noticed like X, Y, Z, are you not seeing the same things as me? And I'm just so curious because it feels like in a space where contemplation and where science is a transformative it's not a standstill, right? It's not saying that this is it and forever. Yeah. There's always things to be questioned. Was there any of that type of contemplation when you were there? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually have been teaching other physicians all through my career. And so, you know, it's really, because the thing is, is if you can hold yes and, you can, you can take an evidence-based PubMed study and you can blow it to pieces. Like, you know, the, let me talk to you. Like if you use your intellect and you use your insight that's coming from your creative source, you can show up and talk about a whole and any evidence-based study. And you can also come in and talk about why a whole person healing system is never going to fit that paradigm in a way they can understand. And um, no, not everyone could do that role. It's, you know, we all have a piece in this huge array that we're offering, that we're doing. And yes, I polarized some people. And yes, I irritated people, but never when they were able to have a one-to-one -one conversation with me, only when they were viewing something I was doing outside of talking to me. When they sit down to talk with me, they were like, dang, I can't, I can't refute this person. <laughs> like, there's compassion, there's logic, there's incredible, I'm very bright, and I totally own that, you know, like, and, and sometimes I use that to my advantage, when I find someone's logic is lacking, or their knowledge base is lacking, I'm like, look, I'm sorry, I'm a smidge smarter <laughs> than you in this moment, but I am going to use that to the advantage of something I'm serving, and I'm not, like, going to slack off from that, you know, when I was young, it wasn't cool to be smart, women, we're embodying a model that being geeky in math and science was wrong. And it was better to be in the humanities. It's sexier to be stupid. I mean, I'm so glad that those chains have been broken. But when I was in middle school, it was way sexier to the boys to not be smart. And I had a series of events, so it's a long story, where by the end of seventh grade, I was in the front row of class going, yes, I know the answer. <laughs> you know, like I was yes. done. I was done playing around in someone else's story. And I think because I had looked into the, all the other modalities before starting medical school, naturopath, et cetera, et cetera, I really came into it awake to what I was going to be dealing with. It wasn't like, a massive awakening. I kind of knew at the beginning of medical school, this is Everest. I'm going to be climbing Everest. I'm not going for a walk in the hill country. I'm climbing a huge mountain. I know where I want to be. I know what I want to know. And I know the credentials I'm going to need to be able to speak to this. And it's going to take me a very, very, very long time. And it did. It took me 20, year, 20 plus years to gather up all the educational pieces. And 
and to be able to apply them in clinical environment, then to be able to speak about them, and then to be a resource and mentor to younger physicians who actually believe the same things. I can't tell you how many conversations I have done on the fly with young physicians who actually believe these things. And they say, I don't really know. I don't really know who to turn to. I don't know really where to go with this. And uh, my heart really goes out to them. But I always sort of try to think of it in the sense that I can mentor in the way I was never mentored because they're really, we're in a process in a de-evolution and you know, there was a crescendo where medicine was all men. They took, we took healing out of the hands of women. It went, you know, fully into the hands of men who really didn't understand and didn't embrace and didn't incorporate the aspects. And now we're in a reclaiming time where there are actually a lot of physicians who believe that holistic arts and botanicals and energy medicine have a hundred percent role in their practices. It's not as far off as many of the healers who sit fully outside the allopathic model might believe. And I only know this because I live in both worlds and have spent a lot of time with many different healers in many different environments. Wow, that's so comforting to hear because as a healer who's really far removed from the medical world and given my own experiences, I just, I truly avoid it as much as possible. Um, and something that we were kind of talking on before we got on the podcast of having proper communication, because often they're trying to say the same thing, but just in their own language. And I, and I love that because I feel like that could rewrite a lot of my experiences with doctors and build a better relationship with that, because I do love medical science and think there's so many incredible um, feats that they have accomplished and that it holds a place into it. And I really see the future is these holistic sciences of Ayurveda and yoga and Reiki coming together in the medical world. So I'm curious, what are some of those inklings? And you're a trailblazer, yeah. I mean, total <laughs> rebel. It sounds like you're already blasting off on this whole path. And I, I just love to see it because this is the direction we're going in. What do you see? How does this come like in a practical sense? Like in a physical uh, sense, what does this look like? Well, I think the first thing, first of all, there's one piece, which is understanding that I'm going to, again, I'm on my soapbox a little today, but private equity, which owns corporations that own medical practices, does not equal healing. Okay, so private equity is an entity, literally, in its own right, that has no intersection with the wants, beliefs, and needs of the clinicians existing within it. So private equity is profit-driven capitalistic model of healing, which now is the primary driver of 90% of medical practices. And most physicians, there's a conservative estimate of 50% physician burnout, like as in like severe, like wanna leave the practice, but hands are tied all the way into a continuum of contemplating ending their lives. Like, sorry, trigger warning here, but you know, unaliving themselves. So I think we have to recognize how powerful the misery existing within medicine for the provider is right now. Here we have taken bright, creative, ingenious, motivated people and constrained them in a system that's diametrically opposed to their own personal beliefs. So on a very fundamental level, just looking at the basics of how allopathic medicine is delivered, that's fundamentally broken. And yes, a lot of good is happening, but we have transitioned the, the model of delivery of that care out of the hands of the clinician decision makers. Mm -hmm. And they're very unhappy about it, which makes them less pleasant people. They're often overbooked, overwhelmed. They're working 14 hour days. They have what they call pajama charting, which is often two to three hours of charting, following up emails, labs, visits at night. I have actually never met, except for one, and I met a lot, but maybe just one absolute idiot who is a doctor. Like really the majority of them are actually very compassionate. They've seen a tremendous amount of suffering. They're there to serve. They've made incredible sacrifices to be where they are. They, they went to school all through their twenties. They often work nights and weekends. They often do their work at the exclusion of own personal gain. There's a subset of them that are making a lot of money that have a lifestyle style practice that's 
different, but the preponderance of clinicians in out. So just having a sensitivity to the fact that we're in a very, another place where things are starting to crescendo. And what's happening is that clinicians are leaving and creating their own practices, but it's often a little bit perilous because you can't get insurance because of contracts. People aren't really clear that they want to pay a monthly fee, like a concierge or direct primary care. But these clinicians are so resolute that they, they don't want to stop practicing, which is what I did, because I was just like, I, this is so corrupt. I can't undo this another second. Um, and then I just needed a break. But they, they don't want to stop practicing, but they cannot exist in the system. And I, you know, I encourage people to appreciate that they are then going to bring a lot of insight and knowledge into those visits. And we pay for a lot of things in life that are extemporaneous. And I'm not talking about people who are really, really just getting by. Like it's really, really tight times for whatever the reason. I'm talking about everything from the middle of the road beyond, you know, paying to see some of these clinicians is probably well worth it in whatever way, in the same way we might pay for a massage. Any rate, so that's that piece. The second piece is that I think that because a lot of the, the sort of holistic healing community has felt this denial and lack of embrace and lack of inclusion, um, there's a certain sort of like a, a you are the other mindset. So sometimes there can be sort of like, well, I own this, you don't know about this, and therefore you don't accept me or know me. And I just, I'm going to have a wall here. And so I'm going to be this is just my own experience, perhaps even a little extreme in how I share what I believe to you. And um, that doesn't work so well either, right? That draws up the nervous system, it creates tension. So I always say, you know, the common ground we can all meet in, at least initially, is understanding that you can't supplement your way, just like you can't pharmaceuticalize your way out of a disease state. These, these, one for the other doesn't matter. We have to go deeper into the roots of where problems lie, into sleep patterns, into self-belief patterns, into how we move, how we eat, where we get community. Um, and then we can escalate creatively from there the modalities that we incorporate in that healing journey, which may include pharmaceuticals, which may include surgery. But that's the trajectory. It's lifestyle first. Then, of course, if you have cancer or advanced autoimmune disease or something that requires an immediate intervention, don't delay. Get Hop on that because oftentimes if you slow the progression of something, you can really ramp up your lifestyle pieces and then proceed as needed within a whole person healing system to incorporate botanicals, body treatments, energy medicine, even deep metaphysical clearing, plant medicine, whatever it is that's one's own personal healing journey, which is, you know, I think my last point on this is that I think as personalized devices become more prominent, meaning the aura ring, the garum, you know, all these things that are monitoring, there will be a transition point where it'll do beyond what's just the heart rate variability and sleep patterns. It'll start looking at hormonal levels. It'll start looking at, I don't really know when the technology, five to 10 years max, I would say, someone's working on it now. Where there's a continuous monitoring of glucose, we're going to now transition to estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, you know, all these hormonal movements. We'll look at brainwave patterns, heart rate patterns, and people will get a printout at the end of the month. Hey, these eight days, you were at, opt you were at peak flow. And guess what you did on those days? You walked, you moved, you loved, you had sex, you had good bowel movement. You know, you did all the thing, you meditated, you did pranayama, you did your mantra, you did your spiritual, you did Agnihotra, like whatever it is you needed to do. You know, maybe you went to church. I don't know. I feel like that's very difficult and toxic, but you know, whatever it was, whatever it was that, you know, and you can start to observe these things took me to balance. These things promoted appropriate circadian rhythm, appropriate hormonal balance, appropriate heart rate variability based on things I did in my life. And then we begin to see all those additive choices conjoined with trauma, conjoined with environmental toxins. That's what creates disease, mental, emotional, spiritual. So I think that's the future we head towards where the two are vastly intersecting. 
I love that. I and initially I'm thinking in order for that to happen, there ha that wall has to be taken off. There has to be that communication where it's like I'm not in the we're both in the same world. And it's so interesting that you brought up about doctors are healers themselves because it's something I was contemplating kind of in a funny way. I was watching a show of it was probably like Grey's Anatomy. I was watching. Yeah. And it, it, like you think about it, but they do. They have this loving and compassionate. At least that's how they're portrayed in the show. And I was thinking about that. What is the difference, like on that soul level between the two? And one is asked to deny their intuition again and again and relinquish their power. So they are disconnected and they have to disassociate. And at the same time, what is their healing plan? Like you were saying, that was what got you back to this whole world anyways. So, you know, they have to go through so much grief. I cannot even, when I think about it, I have to, I have to disassociate from how much grief that they constantly have to go through. So if there's no emotional healing happening on that level, then we're just in that karmic cycle of being able to project it back onto their patients and again and again. So I'm curious to hear about what are these communication tools that we can have uh, to better understand and, and say that we're saying the same things. I know that yeah. you mentioned that, like what exactly is that? And I can actually give an example too. So, you know, my experience in the medical world is kind of like, I, I had amenorrhea, a lack of venties, and they wanted to just prescribe me birth control every single time. And I constantly had to fight for, no, that's not how I want to heal. Um, and then whenever I would say, well, what are you going to use instead? Like you need your period to protect your eggs. That's the language that they chose give me I would say oh you know I'm gonna discover it my own way find the root cause of it herbal formula it was like oh well I'm wearing like three eyes which I am <laughs> but you know like it just it made me very uncomfortable it made me very adverse to that world so even in that specific example what is a way to communicate well I think that I think that the so first let's look at the botanical piece this is one that's um my favorite mentor is Dr. Taroni Lodog. So for people that um, are interested in a great MD that does a lot with botanical medicine, Dr. Taroni Lodog, uh, Lodog is fantastic. She has a website, she does classes, she's active on social media, and she was my mentor. She was a midwife first, massage therapist, then she did a residency and became a physician, but is really centered in the earth. And I think that the botanical medicine piece has two arms to me. The first arm is that, and we know this as participants of Ayurveda, that plant cultivation vastly differs, right? So how the plant has grown, its own environment, whatever alkaloids are present, whatever tannins are present, whatever volatile organic compounds are present, that give their mechanistic aspects outside of the, the juju piece, the prana piece, like purely in that mechanistic world. Um, it's a slightly un, un, un uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's not that it's unpredictable because generally they're safe, but the mindset is one of liability, meaning what if I overprescribe it or I underprescribe it? I can't actually control it. And it, it, what's beautiful about this is that I had a Vaidya, which is, uh, I'm sure you're aware, but for listeners, the sort of very scholarly Ayurvedic physicians from India um, on a discussion I was leading, and we were talking about it, and a physician confronted him very directly and said, well, how am I supposed to know how to do this? And he said, work with someone who knows how to do it. You don't have to know how to do it. And there was almost like this sigh of relief, like, oh, okay, I don't have to know how to do it. And she was worried about interactions of medications and botanicals, which of course is the secondary piece of this, of what if uh, something I'm prescribing is ineffective in the setting of this botanical, which of course can happen. We can amplify them, their outcomes, and we can also negate their, the pharmaceutical outcomes from certain botanicals that change metabolism rates and work in different mechanisms. So at any rate, there's this concern that things haven't been studied because it's a hundred constituents versus one. And if you find a really skilled um, clinician or botanical, someone who's really invested in botanical medicine, they really do know how to safely use them. So I think in some ways it's sort of bridging that language of I can appreciate that botanical medicine might seem foreign to you. 
we aren't really always clear all the various elements that are present. However, I also appreciate that for many millennia, women used these tools of self-healing. And it's something I'd like to explore, and I think I have time to explore it. I'm not in an acute or emergent situation. And I'd love for you to explore that with me. And I, what I'd like to do is try these other methods, come back to you in six months, look at the labs again, and we can talk about it and brainstorm together. What are, what are my next steps from there? Am I seeing improvement? Are things shifting? Should I consider acupuncture? You know, whatever the pieces are. And I think if you can approach the clinician as a collaborative element and say, listen, I really want to take charge of my health. I'm going to work on my diet, my stress, my sleep. But this piece here is also really meaningful and important to me. And um, that's one way that a lot of times people are reasonable. They'll say, especially around women's health. I mean, we know there's a lot of botanical medicine happening and we want to be careful. Of course, we don't want people spending money on things that aren't going to work for them or somewhat sensationalized or are formulated in too general of a way. So I always tell people, you know, approach your, your clinician as a collaborator, as opposed to an authority. Yeah. I love that power dynamic because it does help you to reclaim power of this is what I know. And this is what I'm trusting what I'm going to go for. But at the same time, I appreciate what you're saying too. I'm not just like shutting you out and leaving and we're never going to see each other again. Exactly. Mine might've been what I've done. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, you're not the first nor the last, but I'm just offering an alternative to when one finds oneself in that kind of impasse, like how to, anytime you're in that impasse, it's like, okay, so how do I hold my power in this place compassionately so that I'm not, that I can maintain a connection in some circumstances, it's completely appropriate to cease connection and to find a new clinician to work with. It just depends, you know, and that's obviously so unique and so independent to each person. Definitely. I love the work that you do with physicians. I'm so curious to hear more about it. Like what are some of those notable, noticeable shifts that your physicians have had going through your programs? And what are the applications? Do they take that back and go to their practice? Are some called to go yeah. and start their own practice? A little bit of both. Um, I liked what you said a bit earlier about holding the grief of the denial of self. Okay, so you know we know in Ayurveda that when we suppress urges, pee, poop, sex, sneeze, you know we don't we imbalance vata, right? The vayus. And physicians, unfortunately, from the very get-go are denying sleep, they're denying pee, poop, food, right? Basic human self-care needs. And I think it sort of chisels away over and over and over, like the water in Grand Canyon, where there's actually, as you, you know, really wisely said, this sort of canyon of grief within self, of denial, denial of self. And it can start at a very basic level, like these needs. And, you know, some physicians have like a hero's complex or they think they're the savior. There's an ego. <laughs> there's, a whole, there's a whole other piece of this story that's not, that's pretty toxic. But let's just say we're talking about someone a little more grounded who's basically just trying to show up and help earn a good living, you know, be a good person. And so what happens is that there actually builds up a lot of judgment and shame and self-hatred. And, and, and when I say self-hatred, I really mean denial of the beauty of self, right? The inability to look at self and say, oh, you're beautiful. You're amazing. I love you. It's more like, you know, judge, 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 judge. I should, I could, I would, you should, I should. You know, it's like this whole continuum of self-judgment that's actually not apparent to most people, even to a lot of the clinicians themselves initially. Like, there's all this negative self-talk thoughts that are sort of being cultivated. I like to use the analogy of like you walk out to a garden, you know, at the end of the season, the soup you want to make, and you know that you need to till the soil and plant certain seeds to get that soup. But if you're, if the thoughts that you're tilling and the thoughts that you're cultivating lead to anxiety and self-hatred and judgment and shame, you're not going to get to the soup you want, that juicy soup of life. And so we have more command over our thoughts that we cultivate than a lot of 
clinicians realize. A lot of people in the holistic community have a very like fundamental understanding and a much higher emotional intelligence. Like there's this model, oh yeah, I get it, how I think, what I cultivate grows, duh. But in the clinician world, it's not as apparent. It, and I didn't mean that in no dis, you know, derogatory or sarcastic way. It's just the mind is Oh, hold on one second. I, I think your your sound went off for a second. So I think that for the clinicians, the, the journey that we take in the coursework that I do and the program that I do, I do it once a year, it's 10 weeks. And um, we actually explore the origins of thoughts through mindfulness. We learn sort of the principles, very basic principles of Ayurveda. We don't we learn the gunas. We learn the gunas before we learn the doshas. We look and think about Agni and nourishing Agni and intellect. We look at um, movement. There's yoga classes. There's a self-care box where they get to nourish themselves and, and work on the barriers they have to nourishing themselves. Because we know that there's a little bit of a painful gully that one has to cross when you're starting that journey of like, I'm gonna really look at this because there's pain in there. There's unexperienced emotions in there. There's a soup in there that's like, whoa, I'm swimming in this and I don't like it. Um, and you know, a lot of times we, particularly physicians, love this culture of busyness, but I'm just gonna get busier and busier and busier between my kids, my partner, my social clubs, my work, my practice, my board certifications, my professional affiliations, my book writing, my public TED talk speaking. It's like, la 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 la, you know, and there's this incredible amount of busyness happening that's very counterproductive to emotional awareness. And I think, again, the holistic healing community in all of their facets have a much more beneficial and pronounced relationship to one's own emotional wellness as a healer and an emotional awareness as a lens in the healing journey for people through their own process. It's accepted, it's cultivated, it's talked about, it's engendered. You know, there's, it's not, that that's not happening in medicine. And so in the course, we really work on that, which can be a little widely sometimes because it can be uncomfortable, but I really love to see the progress that comes over time because people feel more joy in their life, more relaxation, more connection to intuition. They look at that grief piece a bit. They may not, in the 10 weeks, they may not dive into it deeply, but they at least begin to understand, hey, that's something I want to look at, something I want to think about. And some go on to renegotiate their contracts and their practices. Some bring Ayurvedic techniques into their practice. Some go on to create their own course. Some leave medicine. Um, it's, a, it's a broad range, but really what my goal is to empower them to find a more joyful and um, a pleasant experience of life. And if that's in medicine, that's amazing. If it's not, I'm, I kind of help them with that journey out. Because, you know, in some ways, some people may not, it may not be their, the only thing they do. They may have other ways they can contribute and offer thoughtful things to society. And so to stay miserable in a system that's, like I said, largely driven by this patriarchal capitalistic colonialized version of healing, um, which has its benefits. When you need surgery, you need it. When you have cancer, you want chemotherapy. I'm not one of those people that says you, it's either or. Yeah, I love that you meet them where they're at because it does make sense that a lot of these practices are so integrative. It can really just be a part, I mean, simply, in yes. our data, it's, it's how you're eating. You, you eat a meal every day anyway, so it's not like you have to carve out more time for that. It's just changing the way in which you do things. So it's so applicable and it it's, could be, yeah, no matter what choice they're going to choose in their life, what route they're going to go into. But also I was thinking, but at what capacity, it, it really depends on where they are in their awakening because ultimately that structure is toxic and helping them deny those basic needs and support that they that they need. But it really kind of just depends where they're at and what they need in those moments, um, which is helpful. I I kind of wanted to change this conversation because I, I follow you on Instagram and I 
love seeing um, this farm and I'm just so curious to hear more about it because I just see the joy in your eyes. I get joy when I get to see you cultivating your herbs um, <laughs> and cultivating these like beautiful dishes. So tell me more about that type of joy that you get. Well, so what, um, sorry, my dog's going bananas here. Oh, yeah. um, give me one sec. I can't even, I can't even hear over him. Um, <laughs> so, wow, that's pretty impressive that he talked. <laughs> yeah, he's so loud. Um, so what, what happened for me was, again, this has all been part of my own healing. So when I, when I first started in medicine, I had already done some training in botanical medicine and I'd already done some cooking and exploration of different ways of eating, plant-based eating. At that time, there were various elimination diets I had tried. And I had grown up, one of the really fun things that my parents had given me was we used to go to a lot of farmer's markets. And what I began to realize was that it was like my system loves high octane food, like food that's like, and we know, you know, we think about it from Ayurvedic standpoint of prana, but from a Western standpoint, vitamins, minerals, the vital components of plants decompose the longer they're from the farm. And some foods have a huge carbon footprint. Berries come in the winter from South America, you know, things like that. So though it may look like and taste like, there are subtle things that change for food over time when they have had longer uh, transition from farm to table. And so I just realized through the years that a decompression point for me was to go to farmer's markets, create community, create conversations. And then when the digital era arrived in camera, uh, if you will, in 2006, I got a Canon Rebel. I'd always been a photographer, but it's a lot of, it was a lot of work then. So in 2006, the digital camera revolution came and maybe initially I was like, it's not the same as print film. But then I realized like, oh, you can take these pictures and you can tell stories. And so I actually started a blog, started Food Blog back in 2006. And that was really when I realized that storytelling and bringing the beauty and vibrance of nature was telling a really rich story that I could do, uh, it would take me a lot longer to do with words. And so I began sort of embarking on a visual storytelling journey as much of a um, verbal. So on the medical side, I'm pretty intellectual. You know, it's a lot of sort of very precise speaking. But in my kind of intersection with the general public, I really prefer, there's a lot I could say that I actually don't because I think social media often limits the discussion to short form and things get lost in translation. And I just, I don't know, I never have seen the, seen the true, true path through that coming from just the knowledge base. And so at any rate, I realized what I wanted to do in sort of a more public facing way was to tell stories and tell stories about plants and vibrancy and nature. Because I really do believe that our intersection with nature elevates our consciousness and nature is the greatest healer. Even in the most turmoil of the last insane two years, I could go out to Redwoods, I could go out to Saguaro Forest, I could go out to a farm and look at a flower and photograph it and think about it, and my spirits would be lifted. And though I know that's not true for everyone, even if I just encourage a few people for whom that is true for them as well, then I, then I feel 100% grateful for the time and energy it's spent to share what I'm experiencing <laughs> that's not performative for the camera. I pretty much, you know, what you see is what you get. Like there's, you know, occasionally we'll be like, get that shot, that's so pretty. But for the most part, my general approach is if I'm seeing beauty and I capture the beauty, I'm, I'm telling the story of nature. I'm, I'm the, I used to do a lot of lectures before the pandemic for physicians and I would take food for the lecture. I always said, let the food teach you as well. Let the intelligence of the food come into your being. And I feel that way in the images and how I create them. It's let the image, the intelligence of the image come into your being and inform you in ways that my just talking from a place of intellect won't, won't accomplish the same thing. So I love to go to farms. And in fact, we just moved from Phoenix to California and I'm loving the abundance here. And my goal is to get 
a small piece of land and to have retreats, workshops for everyone, not just physicians, but a place people can come and experience nature as I know it and the healing capacity that can live in your garden even. So we'll, we'll see what the divine has in store. I'm in service to her. So if that's what's meant to be, I'm sure it will unfold in its own natural way, but I'm a little impatient at times, but <laughs> you know, I, I, I welcome that as an opportunity at some point. I, yeah, I feel you on that. I have a lot of Mars energy. I wonder if that is rules your chart too, but yes. Saturn. Right, um, Saturn me. and Mars right in the mid heaven. <laughs> <laughs> He's telling me to slow down, um, yeah. but I love those visions and I love that there's so much wisdom and I agree. I think us connecting back to source in all these different ways and understanding that's what Ayurveda says, where our food comes from and building that connection on a level that we can't talk about is is everything. So I, I love that. That's just so em embodied. That's a, that's one of your gifts, just so embodied um, and inspiring. And I think that's really hard coming from, or it must've been a, a, something on your journey because coming from the medical world where that is not seen um, and it's just t telling other people what to do, it's, it's very integrated in who you are. Yeah, actually I've had some really dark nights of the soul. I will not kid you. I don't like to sugarcoat the fact that it actually has been a really difficult journey at times, but um, I, you know, I accept all of it, you know, I accept that, you know, we all have a unique awakening that's in front of us. That's not entirely going to be easy or quick. It's not McDonald's, you know, <laughs> like I want to, I want to, I want to fries and shake with that awakening. Um, <laughs> no, <nope. laughs> it's going to be a little bit harder than that. And, and that's the grit that women have. I mean, goodness, you know, we have incredible strength, incredible grit, incredible tolerance for the uncomfortable. And uh, we can do it. We can do those hard things. I love it. I am going to have your Instagram linked here because I want my whole community to follow you and feel that connection to Mother Earth in the beautiful way that you share it. I would also love to hear how our community can connect with you further and work with you, do your program, all that good stuff. Absolutely. So I um, I have a website, dr siri chan, so dr s i r i c h a n d that has a link to any of the programs. I'm on most of the social cha uh, channels as Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, Siri Chand. And I really, I think that um, my intersection with the general public is still developing. You know, at this point, it's really primarily been clinicians, but there, if there's enough interest in the healing communities to hold space for some uh, various types of you know, learning, connection, collaboration, I'm always open to that. So I haven't really developed in that direction, but I do a lot of blogging and writing and sharing, and I hope to have a cookbook out or writing some wisdom knowledge compilation in the next year or two. So they could look for that at some point in time. Oh, I love all of that. I'll have the link to your website below, um, but definitely keep me in the loop on your cookbook. I would love to talk about that. Yes. Um, if you're ever wanting to come back on, because yeah. Oh, yeah, because it really is this, um, I'll just close with this thought that, you know, food for thought, and I can come back and talk about the book once it's written, but we have an infinite, literally infinite, the infinity sign relationship with nutrients, right? Whether it's energy we're consuming, magnesium, calcium, phytonutrients, you know, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, like the, the natural world is creating all these nutrients we're consuming them, transforming them, and giving them back. And that infinite cycle has many points of intersection where we can heal, where we can do work, where we can evolve. And that's why conversations around nutrition are so myopic, right? We say, oh, it's calories in, calories out. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Sure. Yes. However, <clears throat> When we look at the prana, the vital capacity of the food, we look at the production of the food, we look at how we cook the food. Sure, steaming is a little different than deep frying or broiling. We can look at how we eat the food, consuming slowly and thoughtfully is a little differently than in front of the TV. We can look at what's inherent imbalances in the body that food is driving or is not driving. We can look at the microbiome and how we eliminate the waste that we need and how that cycle 
continues in an infinite loop. And it's the longest, if you will, relationship we'll have in our life is the one with food. And we are in infinite connection to the divine because she is always nourishing us, always. Only if we would just wake up to see that. And then I think a lot of behaviors around that which is happening to the earth, which is giving her, um, you know, we're not in the jet sense, right? You can eat all the processed and packaged food you want, um, but it's, you know, it's toxicity in, toxicity out. You develop that relationship with the infinite nature of nutrient movement and your whole system will expand, evolve, and light you up in a way you'd never thought possible. Oh, wow, I love it. I cannot wait for it to come out. That's such a beautiful sentiment to end on. Um, and just thank you again, Dr. Sari Sean, for your wisdom. I just, I love talking to um, people who are so embodied and have so much wisdom within them and it shares and out in this world, that's more of what we need. So thank you again. Yes, and thank you for your podcast. You're creating community, you're collaborating. I appreciate you reaching out to me and thank you for inviting me as a guest. Yes, of course. All right, everyone, thank you so much for listening and we'll have you next time on the show.